This fivefold awareness is not an act of thinking or volition, it is merely awareness accompanied by equanimity. That the channels of awareness are five in number accounts for the fact that the state of mind of the first jhana is comparatively gross and capable of being refined further, i.e. in the first jhana, the mind has not completely calmed down. Hence it is overburdened and so in danger of backsliding and losing its exalted state. Insight into this situation prompts the thought, what if I were to discard some of these factors in order to make the mind more calm and refined? What if I were to establish it more firmly in jhana by reducing its heavy burden and so guard against the possibility of backsliding and dissipation? The meditator then considers ways and means of discarding some of the jhana factors. Putting this into practice, he discards the factors in succession until he attains the last jhana. To the ordinary man, the first absorption with its five factors seems extremely tranquil. It is certainly a degree of calm and fineness well beyond the reach of the average man. Still in the eyes of an accomplished meditator or an Aryan, noble one, it is still coarse and unstable and therefore insecure. The meditator therefore strives for the second and higher jhanas. The second absorption comprises three factors, the taka and vikara having been discarded. When the meditator has considered and examined each of the five factors thoroughly, he comes to realize that Vitaka and Vikara are coarse factors compared with the others. Thus he begins to concentrate on the jhana factors in a different way, giving up the awareness of Vitaka and Vikara. The more he moves away from these two factors, the more aware he becomes of the other three. Suppose a person is first looking at five different objects at the same time, and then gives up his interest in two of them which are grosser than the others. The attention given to the three remaining objects will then be keener, more refined, and more concentrated than it was before he omitted the two gross objects, the way in which Vitaka and Vikara are dispensed with is the same. First the meditator must leave the fast absorption and resume watching his breathing, right from the steps of counting and connecting. This is done in order that Vitaka and Vikara may be examined, at the start when they are still very coarse. By clearly perceiving their particular characteristics of coarseness the meditator arrives at the mature decision I will have nothing more to do with these two factors, I will no longer let them exist in my mind. In this way he manages to diminish Vitaka and Vikara while intensifying his concentration on rapture and happiness. The resulting absorption has then only three factors and is therefore at a higher level in the systematic practice of the fine material absorptions. The third absorption is constituted of two factors, the factor of rapture having been discarded in the same way as were Bataka and Vikara. Once the meditator has become familiar with the second absorption and has reflected on its constituent factors, he comes to realize that even rapture is a coarse factor and that giving it up will bring even greater calm than before. He therefore determines to give up rapture leaving only happiness, sukha, without the exhilaration of pity. He then experiences only an exceedingly serene happiness due to the power of mindfulness and clear comprehension. Thus rapture has to be given up in the same way as Vitaka and Vikara. The fourth absorption is also constituted of two factors, but here happiness has been replaced by equanimity. Here again the same principle applies, having reflected often on the factors of the third absorption, the meditator realizes that happiness is a comparatively coarse and turbulent state of mind, that it still wavers and can easily be disturbed. And that it should be refined and calmed down even further, he therefore makes an effort to subdue the feeling of happiness so that nothing remains but equanimity, which no longer provides a basis for experiencing happiness. At this stage the mind is most steadfast and calm. It is bright and pure and devoid of even the most sublime sense of liking or disliking. There remains only detached awareness and the state of one-pointedness with regard to the thing reflected on. What does the mind then reflect on? It reflects on its neutral feeling, upekavidana, feeling that is neither pleasant nor unpleasant. This feeling is based ultimately on the breathing, it is the highest of the material absorptions, rupajana. Here now is a summary of the distinguishing features of the four absorptions based on the Buddha's own words as recorded in the Pali Canon. The first absorption arises out of detachment from sensual objects and unwholesome states of mind. 
and is accompanied by applied thought and sustained thought and by rapture, and happiness, which, though born of detachment, are still coarse. It is the first level in the fine material realm, Rupajana. The second absorption arises through the subsiding of applied thought and sustained thought and is accompanied by inner tranquility and oneness of mind and by rapture, and happiness which are calmer and more refined since born of concentration. It is the second level in the fine material realm, the third absorption arises through the fading away of rapture, is accompanied by reflection with mindfulness and clear comprehension of the highest order, and brings the meditator an even more refined happiness. It is the third level in the fine material realm, the fourth absorption arises through the disappearing of all feelings, pleasant and unpleasant, which were present in the earlier stages, and is the purification of mindfulness which is now applied to reflection on this neutral feeling. It is the fourth level in the fine material realm, when the four absorptions are compared from the practical point of view, certain significant differences become evident. Taking as our basis for comparison the sources, or causes of arising, of the different absorptions, we see that the first absorption is born of detachment from sensuality and unwholesome states of mind, the second is born of detachment from vitaka and vikara. The third is born of detachment from rapture, and the fourth is born of detachment from all feelings, pleasant and unpleasant. As to whether or not the higher absorptions are, like the first, detached from sensuality and unwholesome states of mind. It should be understood that anything discarded in a lower stage remains absent in higher stages and is therefore not mentioned again. We mention only things that remain, problems still to be solved, at the higher levels of jhana. For instance, in the first absorption sensuality and unwholesome states of mind neither disturb nor even appear to the slightest degree. While Vitaka and Vikara are a problem to be dealt with .so, in dealing with the second absorption, we no longer mention sensuality and unwholesome states of mind but speak only of Vitaka and Vikara, whose turn it now is to be given up in order to leave a more intensified rapture and happiness. On attaining the third absorption, the meditator realizes that rapture must be given up as well in order that the next higher level may be attained in which there remains only happiness. Finally, with the fourth absorption, even this very subtle form of happiness must be given up completely leaving only equanimity. Summing up, the first absorption arises only when there is no more disturbance by sensuality and unwholesome mental states. The second absorption arises only when there is no more disturbance by applied thought and sustained thought, even though they are of the fine material realm. The third absorb, tie-in arises only when there is no more disturbance by rapture, even though it is of the fine material realm. And the fourth absorption arises only when there is no disturbance by happiness, even though it is of a lofty and purely spiritual nature. Needless to say there is no disturbance by unpleasant feelings either, this sums up the basis of the various absorptions and the criteria for the different levels of jhana. Taking distinguishing characteristics as the basis for classification, we note that the first absorption is characterized by applied thought and sustained thought, i and the second absorption, these are discarded and rapture and happiness become the distinguishing characteristics. In the third, rapture is also discarded even happiness is not very marked, and the distinguishing characteristic is focusing of the mind with perfect mindfulness and clear comprehension. In the fourth absorption, the distinguishing characteristic is the purification of mindfulness through equanimity. These are the distinguishing characteristics of the various jhanas, taking the taste or happiness concerned with jhana as our basis for classification. We note that in the first absorption rapture and happiness are born of detachment, in the second they are born of concentration. In the third there is happiness alone on a very refined level, and in the fourth absorption. There remains only equanimity with not the least trace of rapture or happiness. Let us elaborate on this a little. I in the first absorption rapture and happiness are born of detachment, they are coarse compared with the rapture and happiness born of concentration. This is because in the fast absorption happiness still depends on applied and sustained thought and is merely a state of freedom. From disturbance by the hindrances, concentration, too, is still rough, it is not yet of the quality required to produce genuine happiness. In the second absorption concentration has enough power to induce a new kind of rapture and happiness subtle than that born of detachment. 
In the third absorption happiness becomes so refined that rapture is given up. The happiness that remains is purely spiritual, an agreeable feeling on a sublime level. Befitting a person who truly possesses mindfulness and clear comprehension. The noble ones acknowledge this as true happiness, I in the fourth absorption there remains only a calm equanimity which has gone beyond happiness and suffering, beyond liking and disliking. These are the levels of jhana, recognized on the basis of taste. The numerical ordering of the jhanas as first, second, third, and fourth is purely a labeling device convenient in discussion and study. Anyone familiar with this system of nomenclature knows immediately all the factors and characteristics involved when the name of any particular jhana is mentioned on if the meditator has thoroughly studied the various aspects of the four absorptions as just explained. His practice proceeds more easily than if he waits for these things to appear before asking what they are and what to do about them. The general student, too, if he understands these matters, can get a fairly accurate picture of the states of mind involved in jhana. This is likely to arouse his interest in these things, so that he wishes to study them further. Rather than looking down on them as of no use to modern man when speaking in technical terms we have to be precise stating how many constituents are necessary to make up a jhana. The number of constituents in the various jhanas are as follows, the first absorption has 20 constituents, the second 18, the third 17, and the fourth also 17. There as follows, the 20 constituents of the first absorption include the 10 characteristics. Already explained as glorious in their beginning, progress, and consummation. Together with the five jhana factors and the five mental faculties, these 20 together comprise the perfected first absorption. These 20 constituents are listed in full in order to show precisely the nature of the first absorption. The meditator should take into account the five mental faculties and their proper relationship with the jhana factors and the ten characteristics. As has already been explained in detail, he should take these ten characteristics as definite criteria for the attainment of jhana. He must not carelessly think of the first absorption as consisting merely of the five jhana factors. It is to make such points clear that we are here specifying the 20 constituents of first absorption in detail. The second absorption has 18 constituents, here the same remarks apply as with the first absorption except that two jhana factors have now been discarded, namely applied thought, scanning, and sustained thought, focusing, there remain only three factors, rapture, happiness, and one-pointedness. Thus the constituents of the second absorption number only 18, 10 characteristics, 3 jhana factors, and 5 mental faculties. The relationships of these three groups to one another are as in the first absorption. The third absorption has 17 constituents, the same remarks apply once again, except that a further jhana factor has been discarded. Only happiness and one-pointedness remain and thus there are only 17 constituents, 10 characteristics, 2 jhana factors, and 5 mental faculties. Their interrelationships are as before, the fourth absorption has 17 constituents, there are two jhana factors, for although happiness has given way to equanimity, equanimity also counts as a jhana factor, thus there are 10 characteristics, two jhana factors, and five mental faculties, as in the third absorption. To sum up, these different numbers of constituents are a measuring rod for studying and precisely examining the several absorptions. Note that while the factors of jhana vary from one absorption to another, the ten characteristics and the five mental factors are present. In all of them, this means that because of the ten characteristics, the last three absorptions are, just like the first, glorious in their beginning, progress, and consummation. The mental faculties become stronger the higher the level of jhana, although their function remains the same throughout. Confidence, effort, mindfulness, concentration, and insight each becomes more refined and stronger in order to meet requirements. For progressing to the next jhana, thus, although the mental faculties do not vary in number, their strength and efficiency vary considerably according to level of jhana. Once the above points are taken into consideration, the differences among the absorptions become clear. Chapter 11, Five Kinds of Mastery, finally we come to what is known as Mastery of the Jhana, Vasi. 
Das means experience, proficiency, skill in some task that one is doing. A man possessed of vast is endowed with absolute mastery over something. Literally the word vast means one who has power, which here implies one who has power over his actions, who can do what he wants to do. As can a powerful man, he is able to act with proficiency, speed, and skill, unhindered by anything, and succeeding as he wishes. Power in practicing samadhi is the result of skill in practice, the more skillful one is, the more power one acquires. Therefore the meaning of vast here is precisely one who has power because he has skill and means. Such a person has skill in relation to jhana in five ways, 1. Skill in inverting the mind to absorption, 2. Skill in entering absorption, 3. Skill in maintaining absorption, 4. Skill in emerging from absorption, 5. Skill in reviewing absorption.